today on Straight Talk Africa, a discussion on the recent presidential election in Cameroon. Did voters have a fair chance to make their choice? Were conditions favorable for all presidential candidates? That's coming up next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters in Washington. I'm Vincent McCory in for Shaka Sali. Today we're discussing the recent presidential elections in Cameroon. Well, Cameroon's longtime leader Paul Beer officially began his seventh consecutive term in power after a constitutional council he appointed rejected all 18 petitions challenging the results of the nation's recent election. Viewers Paul Dio has our report. <laughs> At age 85, Paul Beer, Cameroon's president uh, since 1982, is one of the world's oldest heads of state. He recently won a re-election with 71% of the vote. His strongest uh, challenger, Maurice Akamto, received 14%. Bia's October 7th poll victory comes amid claims from opposition candidates that the election was marred by fraud, including ballot staffing and voter intimidation. But Bia's supporters disagree. Paul Bia is a guarantor of peace, success, prosperity and living together. That's why we've chosen him as our president. Am I telling the truth? Yes, I'm telling the truth. Yes. The Constitutional Council rejected all 18 petitions are claiming fraud, giving the long-time Cameroonian leader a seventh term in office. It's possible that President Abia could remain in power until at least the age of 92. Amid post-election candidate claims, some opposition leaders are rushed to declare themselves as the legitimate winners of the vote. Candidate Maurice Akamto pronounced himself the winner before even the first results were announced. On this, I call on the Republic's Defense Force. Forces of law and order to positively accompany this intense historical moment which the people of Cameroon have collectively Nous a convié collectivement bestowed on us memorable. Mes bras My arms are open for us to work together for our national renaissance jointly. À la renaissance nationale. Kamto, whose claims of victory were short-lived, alleged that six of the 11 members of the Constitutional Council were biased in Bia's favor and could not hand him the success that he claims he rightly deserves. Local and African Union election observers said the poll was mostly successful with minor irregularities that didn't affect the outcome of the vote since they say he allegedly controlled the process. <laughs> Many Cameroonian citizens remained worried about the future of their beloved country and want to see him do more to unite the country. Critics say despite this win, President Bia faces tough times ahead. What's happening in North and South is very sad. Many people are dying, people are suffering, villages are burned. It's not a laughing matter. It's not a matter of elections. It's a matter of survival for the Cameroonian people. And I hope the international organizations will do just that. As tens of thousands of Cameroonians are displaced by a bloody separatist insurgency in the English-speaking Northwest and Southwest continue to push for secession. The chaos began in October 2016 when lawyers and teachers in England English-speaking cities went on strike in protest at having to use French in schools and courtrooms. Clashes broke out in the following weeks and some protesters were killed. Hundreds were arrested and put on trial for charges carrying long sentences or death penalty. Political analysts say support for secession continues to grow as hundreds of thousands demand a breakaway state called Ambazonia. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. 
Well, thanks a lot, Paul, for that report. Our guests today are on the phone from Yaoundé, Isa Chiroma Bakari, Cameroon's Minister of Communication. Here in studio, we have Eric Chinje, analyst, and Bagasi Kora, a viewer journalist. And also, we're hoping to be joined from Los Angeles by Charles and Chang, who is the CEO of the Immigrant Magazine. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, now, first, I want to. Thank you. I want to go first to uh, um, Honorable Minister Chiroma. Uh, there have been protests in uh, Cameroon, in fact, since the end of the elections. And uh, most of those in the opposition are saying uh, the results were not uh, fair because the election, the election process wasn't uh, free and fair, ostensibly because the government controlled the process. Uh, so do they have a, a legitimate case here? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, did you get my question? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to express gratitude and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the government. But uh, the connection is far from being what I expect to be, given the importance of this communication. Mm -hmm. But uh, if uh, in the course of this debate, the line goes up, please call me back, because the, the network is very poor. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, after having said that, um, the election took place. Um, all the necessary conditions have been brought together in order to organize the free, fair, an equal opportunity given to all the contenders, the all the competitors. Yes, uh, you have uh, some of competitors, in particular, the lecturer of university, Professor Kamto, who denied, reject the result, and self proclaimed himself as the elected president. And uh, he made a comment that I, would, I, I wouldn't like to come back to what he said. But as far as the government is concerned, we think that this is the speech delivered by, excuse me, a day dinner. Because it is impossible, I say it is impossible, in an election where... Uh, 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 the first, the contender who arrived first, win the objective. Mm -hmm. Minister Kamto knows it very well. And hello, can you hear me? I hear you. And yes, I was saying that it is impossible, and he knows it very well. Minister, he, uh, he, he denied he denied the result, but he could not produce any grounded and uh, well documented proof to affect his position. Uh, but Minister, the reason why I said that, it, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the only one who rejected the results of this election. There were 18 petitions and. Uh, uh, they, they gave actually the argument as to why. They said there were some, uh, some problems with the process. There were some areas where elections could not take place properly, especially in the Anglophone areas. Also, there were uh, some, some kind of uh, unclear uh, in areas where it wasn't clear if, if the ballot was being held in a free and fair um, manner, given the fact that uh, the electoral system is controlled by the ruling party, by the government, uh, they, they felt that there was an unfairness in the process. And it wasn't just uh, one person. Those were 18 petitions. Well, let me uh, suggest this response. Minister Kamto and all other competitors, they know that Elikan is the independent body entitled by the law to organize the election first. The Constitutional Council is the only institutional body in order uh, entitled to examine 
and to proclaim result of this election. All of them know it, in particular Minister Kanto, Professor Kanto, knows it very well. In case we suspect Elekam or the Constitutional Court to be biased against him or the other competitors, he was not obliged to stand for having accepted, despite the fact that those two institutions are, according to his own understanding and position, they are biased against. Mm -hmm. In full knowledge of this, because this is his statement, I am just uh, repeating what he said, but in full knowledge of this, he accepted to run the election. <laughs> he accepted the litigation raised during this uh, competition, he took it to the Constitutional Court, and he was uh, there from, from uh, day one to the end. But he cannot accept the two bodies for the arbit uh, arbitration mm -hmm. and organi uh, organization of the election. And at the end of it, he said no, he denied, he rejected, and he said that some member of the, of the two used to be the CPDN militant. There is something which is wrong. Okay. Uh, Honorable Minister, let me also get uh, Eric Change's thought here. You see, Eric, uh, one of the things that some have, uh, have, have uh, accused the opposition members of in some, in some cases is actually going to an election knowing fully well that they, there are no institutions that can guarantee a free and fair election. So in the case of Compton or the other uh, presidential candidates, is that their biggest crime? You know, I totally agree with what the minister said. Mm -hmm. They went into the elections knowing exactly what to expect, okay? Um, but I totally also agree that the, this, you could not expect an outcome that would favor anybody else but the incumbent. Mm. So the, you see, this is, this is the tricky situation in which, uh, in the context in which these elections took place. You know, the opposition had a chance to field a single candidate. Then they would have had the, the possibility of monitoring the elections in a much better way than they could. But I don't think the opposition, you know, what we needed were people who could rise above the individual ego-driven need to project themselves. Yeah. That's what we needed on the side of the opposition. On the side of the government, obviously, the government would want to stay in power. That should have been well known. Mm -hmm. The government would use every possibility to stay in power. That is well known. If it happens even here in America. But what, I, what we all hoped was that the Constitutional Court in Cameroon would stand, in spite of all the obvious um, weaknesses that were pointed out by the opposition leaders, we all hoped that the, the Constitutional Court would rise above partisan politics. But under the current constitution of the country, the Constitutional Court is not above the executive. I mean, technically, in as much as theoretically. But when it comes to declaring the results of the yeah. elections, they stand above everybody else, yeah. because beyond them, it's only God. Yeah. It's not even the president. So kind of Cameroonians hoped that would happen. It didn't happen, um, but it's too late to complain. <laughs> so, you know, we have a situation where I wouldn't spend a minute, if I had the chance, on these elections. Yeah. I think we had the outcomes that we had to have. Um, I'd spend time on the future. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Bagasi, you what is going to happen beyond this? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Bagasi, you're a reporter, you're on the ground, and your job is to observe and report on what's going on. What did you see in terms of the playing field, uh, the opposition's uh, uh, kind of uh, chances in terms of uh, being able to communicate their message to the masses through mm -hmm. uh, public events, uh, through press conferences? W what was your observation as you were there? Uh, what I saw and what I heard is that uh, for the first time the opposition has been able to mobilize 
much more people, much more younger people. There were a lot of thousands of people at rally for Maurice Camto or for Cabral Libby, who are latecomers in, in the field of uh, this presidential uh, business. But what I saw also is that uh, uh, the ruling party uh, had all its events live on national television. Uh, what I saw is that uh, opposition candidates sometimes have to hold press conferences in places uh, very tiny who cannot f f uh, uh, you know, uh, receive all the journalists who want to participate. Uh, what I saw is also uh, presidential candidates uh, like uh, Cabral Libby complaining that uh, Elecam will not let some of the observer uh, uh, being pulling places in Cameroon and uh, also in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So there have been some complaints, and as it's been mentioned before, maybe these are issues that should have been taken care of before yeah. the election mm -hmm. to, to challenge the institution who will be running the election before people go in. Because as what, is not, uh, what has not been mentioned here is that ELECAM does not count the votes Elecam organize and then it move on to an administrative body that count the vote where opposition I think has li little to say and it, then it moved to the uh, constitutional okay. court where most of the people have been chosen by, uh, the, uh, president. The, by president. the president. <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, it's like it, you are a part of a process at some point, you know, mm -hmm. somebody else take over yeah. and then you know, by the time you know there is a result and yeah. you have to accept. So you can't uh, even just accuse Elecam you know, for all we, we that We are happened. saying all that. Yeah. Nobody is saying that even if things were right, yeah. Paul Bia will lose. Mm. But because the machine has been around for a long term, yeah. time, he has all these government means to, to make campaign, to convince people. He has also some results, you know, because he's been ruling, you know, he yeah. brought... He has something to show. For, yeah, he, for, he has for something to show, mm, yeah. you know, yeah, which understand. other people don't yeah. have. But yeah. what people are complaining about is, why can't we have a process like we have seen in several other yeah. African countries where yeah. things go smoothly and mm -hmm. everybody agree that... Yeah, yeah, we lost or we won. Some, and it's some fine, African you know. countries still yeah, have many so problems. Several in other. countries, uh, yeah. Charles Chang, I don't know if we, we have him ready in uh, Los Angeles, in our studios there. Uh, Charles and Chang, uh, Charles and Chang, are you up? Uh, welcome. Oh, yeah. Yes, welcome to Africa, uh, to Street Talk Africa, mixing up things. Now, here you just listened, hopefully, to uh, Minister uh, Chiroma and also Eric Chinj and uh, my colleague here in studio. It, and, and the issue here is... Uh, is it about going uh, to the election and, and then later complaining, or should actually the opposition in Africa focus more on making sure that there is a favorable environment, that there are institutions that can guarantee a free and fair election before going to an election, and then you spend a lot of time and an inordinate amount of time whining and screaming and protesting about a bad result or the unexpected result? Expected, in fact. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think you, you, you nailed it. The, the opposition leaders, the leadership in opposition, they have to learn how to work together. They have to learn how to bring the people together and organize themselves better and also work at helping the institutions be straight before they participate. Because the way Cameroon has been for ever has been mostly run by a one man and one party. So for us to be able to challenge that, the people have to organize themselves better and forge a system that will permit some level of transparency, equitable participation, and complete involvement of the different institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to go to Minister Chiroma in uh, Yaoundé. Now, Honorable Minister, you know, yeah. it has been observed that uh, in any country where one particular person has been in power for too long, however well intentioned he is, and of course he does use the power and the advantage of incumbency to continue extending his rule, but eventually, 
when he gets out of power by some way or other, those countries have ended up actually being plunged into chaos because there is a kind of a danger in having a one-man show for generations. Is that a, something that is of concern to the ruling elite in Cameroon, that there, beyond Paul Beer, the country could be in trouble because of not preparing it for, for, for that transition? Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I would like to say hi to Eric Kinge, my brother, my friend. <laughs> and I agree with his analysis. When, and he said that all the members of the opposition, they were ego-driven people. What our people wanted them to do, uh, first of all, let me emphasize the fact that I am not a member of the ruling party. I am not a member of the CPDM. Eric Kinye, my friend, knows it very well. Okay. What Cameroonian wanted? Cameroonian wanted the eight members of the opposition who were running for the presidency to present just one candidate to stand against President Bia. Even in this case, even in this case, let me underscore one thing. To have 25,000 uh, um, uh, uh, polling stations, 25,000. And according to the law, the, um, uh, um, how we call it, um, the code, uh, uh, electoral code that manages the presidential election, each candidate has the right to have three representatives, one inside and two other outside, in case any need be, according to our uh, uh, electoral, presidential electoral code. This means that for your claim to be uh, um, honest, valid, you are supposed for, uh, to have 75,000 people all over the nation to represent you and to uh, to produce the, the, all the, the electoral tally mm -hmm. in order to justify. What the other thing I would like to mention is that, as far as the minister come to his concern, three days three days before the election, take place, mm -hmm. the, the the manager of his election on the press and but announce that they are convinced that they are going to win and they are the winner of this election and they are ready happen what may even if they have to pay their own blow they will do whatever it takes in order to secure honorable their minister Honorable Minister, uh, if I may stay with you for a minute, if we go beyond Kamto and just think about the Cameroonians, uh, think about the nation of Cameroon today and tomorrow and into the future. My question was, is there concern? Do you hear? You're closer to power there. Uh, that there's concern about what the future of Cameroon would look like after Paul Beer, because you talked about ego, but I think politicians are full of egos. That's a fact. Do you see a, any any kind of desire to change things, including the constitution, to create institutions which, in the future, when Paul Beer is not there and his party is not in power, would also give them a fair playing ground so that nobody complains about the election results? Well, no doubt that President Beer who is a wise man. He knows that he is not eternal. He knows it very well. Mm -hmm. And his willingness, his commitment, is to organize himself and the government in a such a way that at due time, at due time, I don't know when, but the time being, he has seven years to go, according to our constitution and the will of the people. But what he has in mind, he knows that he is not eternal. Day in, day out, one day, we have to organize this nation in order to, to enable uh, 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 very talented, competent men and women to take over without chaos, that, as you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. We know it, and he knows it very well. He knows it very well. But let time uh, uh, unfold, and we are going to see how this will happen, how this will 
take place. For the yeah. time being, yes. we, are, we, we are talking about the, the, the result of this election. And all of <laughs> those who are contesting, all of yeah. those who are denying, uh, uh, decrying the, the organization and the result, if they are what we call in, in French the yeah. mauvais perdre. Uh, Okay, Minister. I want Mr. Yeah. Actually, let me, exactly. I also wanted to get Mr. Chinje in here. Eric, you know, uh, as uh, the minister said, President Paul Beer is a wise man. But at the end of the day, President Beer is 85 years old. Uh, Cameroon is full of uh, young men, including people like you, uh, relatively young. He's going to be uh, probably 92 when he's done with this term. Is, is, can you, at this point, really in any way make a case that Cameroon needs to be ruled by the president who is over 85 years old or 85 years old and over? Is that in any way a reflection of the kind of leadership that our Cameroonians need at this point? You know, in the lead up to these elections, I was fairly vocal uh, calling on the president not to run again. Yeah because I thought it was time to re-energize the leadership of the country. And at 85, it's kind of difficult to re-energize, well all right? Intentioned. However well-intentioned. <laughs> so I've always said that, and I know the minister knows uh, my position. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for Issa Chiroma is because he fought. Prior to becoming a member of the government, he fought to get the opposition in Cameroon organized. And it was precisely because he failed to achieve that, that he said, OK, if these guys can't do it, yeah. let me at least work with the government yeah. to make sure they can do it. So I continue to have deep respect for Minister Chiroma. Um, but the fact remains that this country needs new leadership, a quality of leadership that it would be, you know, we cannot find with the current system. So I'm still hopeful that now that things, we have the elections behind us, mm -hmm. this president can find a way to inject new dynamism into the leadership of Cameroon. Yeah. That's why in my last intervention, I said, I am looking to the future. I want to see a Cameroon where our problems are addressed in a manner that resolves them. The Anglophone problem in Cameroon should be resolved. Yeah. The problem of underdevelopment in the northern part of Cameroon should be addressed. The problem in the east should be addressed. The problem of young people who don't have jobs, which is why so many of them are in the, uh, are in, uh, are fueling the crisis in the Anglophone regions. All of these things should be addressed, and if this president cannot address them because he's tired, then we've got a problem in Cameroon. Okay, I'm going to skip you uh, to LA now. Charles, very quickly, in about, let's say, l less than a minute, what are your thoughts on that, the future of Cameroon, uh, especially after Paul Beer? The future of Cameroon after Paul Beer is, in my opinion, is a little scary. We have to, to organize ourselves as a people the Anglophone problem of Cameroon has to be resolved. We have to get back on the drawing table with all Cameroonians speaking as Cameroonians. And then we can be able to resolve our issues and have a way forward. Because I don't see how divided and conquered we can move, move ahead. Yeah, indeed, um, you know, we, we will talk a little more about those issues, but uh, uh, you're tuned into Straight Talk Africa right now. We have more of our discussion in a moment, so don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> the lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African Beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African Beat. Well, a reminder that we appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. And you can also watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program.
On the next Straight Talk Africa, Americans vote in the U.S. midterm elections on November 6th. The poll determines which political party controls Congress and the Senate, as well as many state and local offices. The outcome will impact President Donald Trump's Republican Party agenda. We'll examine what the results mean for America's domestic and foreign policy, particularly as they relate to Africa and Africans, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Well, today we are discussing the recent presidential elections in Cameroon, which saw incumbent Paul Beer winning another term at age 85. Our guests are Asa Chiroma Bakari, Cameroon's Minister of Communication, Eric Chinje is an analyst, Bagashi Kora, VA journalist, and Charles Sanchang, CEO of the Immigrant Magazine. Now, uh, Bagasi, having spoken to a number of people in Cameroon, they were young people, they were people of uh, uh, different ages, uh, what were their major concerns? And we know that there's some of them who have never known any president but except Paul Beer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the main concern uh, uh, you hear after I come to spoke, everybody will say, no, no, we don't want any political fight in this country. We already have crisis in the north uh, and the uh, anglophone region. Please let accept the result as it is and let move forward because I think people are a bit used to it and anything that may look like a change, they don't know what it will bring. You know, and especially having seen political uh, conflict in other country, how far it has taken them. I think people are really worried that, you know, with all the challenges facing Cameroon, that people, uh, the last thing they want is to create a big fight around election result, as we have seen in every course and other places. Yeah, Most, but uh, uh, but the this, this succession question is uh, is. It's a big concern, and people. What people been told, telling me is that maybe uh, nothing is being decided because there was there is really no one who is above the fray, and that the ruling party. You have so many people who are vying to succeed Paul Bia, and the only way to keep that's one of the theory, of course, to keep them to, together is to not open the box. Of course, if anything were to happen or. Paul Bia has to resign today. It will go to the president of the Senate, who himself is 80 plus year old. And uh, it's, <laughs> we don't know, uh, yeah. you know. Now, Honorable uh, Minister Chiroma, uh, the question of uh, Ambazone, the, the Anglophone region, of course, has been big uh, across the continent. People have been curious uh, to see where it goes because when people ask for secession, is because they have tried and tried and tried and felt that they don't feel like they're treated as a part of that particular country. Uh, how best could this be handled so that the people of that region can feel that they're part of Cameroon and they can have uh, the desire to continue staying in, in Cameroon as part of Cameroon? Well, I found the problem in our Anglophone region uh, are concerned well, it is very painful. It, it is deplorable. It is painful to see that Cameroonians are turning the guns to kill other Cameroonians. This is very painful, unbearable. But as far as the president is concerned and his government is concerned, well, we know that through gun, it is impossible to get this problem addressed conveniently. It is impossible. We know it very well. That reason why the head of state put in place commission, any commission. They want all the political leaders, the traditional rulers, the elite, all of them get involved in the process of finding means and ways which will enable us to, to, to come together and to get out of this terrible mess. The Cameroon is a collateral victim. The government is a collateral victim. The government is being victimized by those who resorted to gun in order to address a political issue. We have brothers and sisters who claim to be marginalized, who are being treated as second zone citizens, and this and that. President Diaz summoned his government and he said that, first of all, we have to have a framework which will enable us to sit round the table and to discuss. Honorable and Minister. Framework has to be. 
Honourable Minister. The Constitution and the law of the nation, yes. Uh, Honourable Minister, the President has had more than sufficient time to have done this. Why has it taken so long to address the issue of the people of uh, the uh, Anglophone areas? I mean, it's not a problem that started today. Uh, all these claims, all these charges have been there for many years. Why is another issue? Now we have a hot potatoes in our hands and we have to address it. When you make a retrospection retrospective, why didn't we do or didn't we uh, do this and that? This is another aspect of this problem. Now we have a problem that we have to address. We have to solve this problem through dialogue, consultation, and negotiation. Mm -hmm. There is no any other way to address and to solve this problem. Okay. He knows it, all of us, we know it. Now that he, he received a full mandate and he has all the leverages which will enable us, him and the government, to address this issue after the swearing in of ceremony, after the inauguration, we are going to listen uh, the kind of speech the head of state is going to deliver for his people mm -hmm. and for the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, this is a very tiny issue, and I am convinced that he has it in mind, and this problem has to find uh, uh, within the framework of our laws, this problem has to find a yes. solution. Uh, well, let me go to Charles in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the minister there is saying, uh, forget about the past. Uh, the president has been given a mandate, so the issue of Ambazonia is going to be resolved. Uh, in fact, the Anglophone region probably doesn't have to break away into Amazonia. And so do you, Charles, feel confident that perhaps uh, uh, this time around this issue could be resolved without a resort to violence, the violence that we've been it, witnessing it, for the last month? It, 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 is a, it is a very delicate situation. I really cry for the people who have been dying and those that are, that are pick, pick up arms and are trying to fight a government that is way stronger than them. And I pity my brothers and sis sisters in Cameroon who are hopeless at this point in time. And this problem, I see, could have been resolved from the beginning. It was not so terrible. But the irresponsibility of governance has led to this chaos. It's, it's back to the point where the people were not led properly to where now we are in a dire, desperate situation, and still we've not seen leadership. The people have not seen leadership. So we need people to really take responsibility mm -hmm. now, and really yeah. get to the communities and really get apologize and really call the people with the intention to respect their human rights to respect their wishes and also understand that they have a real issue that is a, a problem of the nation. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem of, of a different country. It's a problem if Cameroonians care for other Cameroonians, they should listen to their problems equally and attend to them. Yeah. And the president is responsible. He has to take that leadership and really go to his people as a leader. He has not paid attention to his people. How, how can you lead the people without paying attention to them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Eric, um, first, uh, I personally, personally, I find it uh, very shameful that we should be talking about uh, a country being divided just by language. You are a Cameroonian. Perhaps there's something else you know that you can tell our viewers. Is it about French and English? or what is really at the core of this issue, and what do you make of the minister's uh, disposition, I mean, position right now that uh, uh, the president is now in a better place, in a better position to resolve the issue? Yeah, two very important things have been said, Vincent. One, by the minister saying, going forward, and he's given the president's speech, post-inaugural speech, as the starting point of moving forward, which is excellent. And Charles saying there's a need to face up to what the real problem is. There is a fundamental problem in Anglophone Cameroon that has to be addressed. There are problems across the country. There are economic problems, political, social, and all of that. But there is this very specific problem on the English-speaking side of Cameroon. I speak as an Anglophone Cameroonian 
who, under, who came to deeply understand the nature of marginalization. We've put it on the table a few times, but we've, it's not, I, can, I can guarantee you a lot of my Francophone brothers in Cameroon do not fully understand what marginalization is all about. And it is this frustration with the inability of the majority to understand and empathize with that minority that is at the heart of the problem. It's not even a language that problem. Is, yeah, that, that's the problem uh, I have, is that uh, how would a country that uh, I would imagine where, where people share, let's say a culture, share traditional languages, be actually divided on the lines of foreign languages, English and French and not Right, because it's a cultural thing. I mean, you know, English came with a certain superculture and French came with a certain superculture. And what we're seeing is a clash of two supercultures. And beneath those, it's a crisscrossing of the local cultures. You know, I come from my traditional culture spans across Cameroon. So, you know, I, I should not be part to this, a party to this. Yeah. But again, those supercultures are so strong. You know, the judicial system that we've adopted in the Anglophone Cameroons is different from the judicial system in Francophone Cameroon. The educational system is different, you know, and you can go on and on. And these are the pillars of any given society. So, you know, we've got a problem in Cameroon from 1961 when we became one nation with two cultures. There was no effort made to this day to create a bilingual nation, mm -hmm. to merge these two. Had we done it back in 61, we would not be talking about a country divided by foreign languages. Yeah. So we've so, not done it. So my, my hope is this going forward, post inauguration of the next president, staying open, president, yeah. but beyond that, that Mr. Bia will see Cameroon put in place an, uh, initiatives that would move this country together. It is, we, we're in such a delicate place right now. Yeah. I, 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 I interact with Anglophones. And we've gone from uh, what was, a, mad, you know, what, what was a, a small group, you know, almost minuscule group of people complaining about um, wanting independence for Anglophone Cameroon, to a situation where virtually I don't know of any Anglophone Cameroonian who'd rather maintain the status quo. Actually, uh, Bagas, you, you had a point you wanted to make. Uh, yeah, yeah, so right now, as we can see, the Anglophone issue is a big issue in Cameroon. But, you know, when you have an election, that's where you discuss some of the major issues. Yeah. And it's been almost absent on this campaign. You know, the ruling party didn't emphasize much on the Anglophone case. The opposition merely had to mention we will do some dialogue and bring everybody on the table. And then on election, we can see we, by the numbers, mm -hmm. we can see by the numbers there was a very, very low turnout in some of the Anglophone mm -hmm. part of the country, like sometimes 5% yeah. in some part of the Anglophone countries. So although it's a major issue, mm -hmm. it looks like Cameroonian maybe have miss um, some kind of opportunity to yeah. debate fully yeah. the anglophone issue yeah. during the election exactly yeah. now minister chiroma uh, you know the, the the there is always that um, issue of the elder man in africa we have a culture where we respect and revere our elders and one of the things that has been observed in cameroon is that uh, the ministers and those around uh, uh, President Beer seem to be so uh, beholden uh, to the older man. The question people ask is, is he capable of listening to others? So can he uh, actually take advice from anybody given that he is, who is a very powerful man, very uh, feared and respected man? Well, when the problem erupted, when the problem arose, I was one of those who thought that uh, there was uh, no Anglophone problem, but the problem is even if there were frustration, they are economically based frustration. But when the lawyers, the teachers, and all others uh, uh, spoke out their mind and brought to our knowledge that there are problems which are not linked to the economic aspect of the nation, 
I am one of those who apologize, and I say that, well, there is a problem. Let me give you an example. According to our own constitution, there is a provision which makes it, makes it mandatory. All the documents issued by the government shall be written in both languages. Unfortunately, for a good deal of time, this, this has not been the case. When this was brought to the knowledge of the head of state himself and all the other members of the government, including the dismantlement of the government, we say that there is something which is wrong here. And this problem has to be addressed immediately. But unfortunately, some of them could not be addressed overnight. The reason why the government is obstructed and all the members of the government. Now, how to settle the issue? On behalf of the government, I say that the government is open. Is open. Are you frustrated? Okay, where? And let us come together and to find means and ways. Now, this frustration. Honorable Minister, you know, when people are willing to yes, die, yes, yes. when people are willing to die for I a don't. cause, it means there is something that is, is so important to them. And they, as they say, there's that expression, is the uh, person who wears the shoe who knows uh, where it pinches more. The people of the Anglophone area have shown that they're willing to die. There has been this militancy, but the government has also hit back and clamped down on the, on the militants there. Uh, is the government willing to declare a ceasefire on its side and say, come to the table, we're willing to listen and resolve whatever issues that are there, and we don't have to resort to fighting? Is the government willing to, down, uh, to put down their weapons? Well, this does not fall within my responsibility and the scope of uh, action. I am a spokesperson of the government. Yeah. I just bring to the knowledge of the world what is the position of, of the government as yeah. far as this aspect of the problem is concerned. Yeah. Let us, uh, after the inauguration of the head of state, we are going to listen to his policy, his vision. Yeah. There are brothers and sisters who are taken hostages in the two regions by a handful of uh, extremists, violent extremists, and you say that they are ready to die. No, they are not going to die. The government will not let them die. And you said, as, if, if the government is ready to to to, and, uh, to proclaim a ceasefire, I don't know. I am just a minister. I don't know what the head of state has in mind. But the continuity, the okay. physical integrity of our nation, falls within the responsibility of our army, the government, and the head of state himself. What I can say on behalf of the government, there is no question which is taboo, except the cessation. The government is not ready to accept the amputation, the split of the nation. Uh, but, and uh, the nation, Minister. Including your brothers and sisters who are in the two regions, all of us, we are ready to come together. Uh, but, you know, uh, Minister, Mr. Minister. There is no problem whatsoever. Mr. Minister, in any region of the world where people have fought for secession, including South Sudan, which is the most recent case, it's because they felt that the central government, the bigger part of that country, did not accord them the same respect, the same dignity as the rest of those uh, of the country. So the people of the Anglophone definitely must feel like they have been cut off from the central government to want to secede. Nobody wants to leave their country. Nobody wants to be separate except when there are some extreme cases, isn't it? Yes, I said that a handful of people, they, are this, they, they, they have already made up their, their religion, they have already made up their mind, but they will, they will be confronted with a, a, a resolution bigger than they have in mind. Yeah. Let us understand that through dialogue, and we have to compromise to know that in this aspect it is possible together to move forward, but this is the red line. This is the Rubicon that uh, it is not possible to cross. Mm -hmm. Now, so when people of good way meet, sit around the table, it is always possible to find solution within a framework that I, I have mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. Okay. Uh, let's listen to Charles and Chang in LA. Uh, the minister there is saying uh, the secession issue is not such a big issue. Uh, those who are agitating, those who are actually who will literally have taken up arms, it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, a few agitators. It's not a big issue uh, and that uh, there is no way Cameroon will be divided. Uh, do you agree? Uh, 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 it's, it's a very delicate situation because for, for too long already, 
they have not been able to ma manage these people that took up arms. And there's chaos in the Northwest and Southwest. And there's been really no governance. And that is very, deli that's very delicate okay, because the people have no leadership or from the, from the so-called terrorists, and they have no leadership from the government. So it's total chaos, which is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that needs to be done, the, people, the leadership has to recognize the problem the people, the people are, request, are requesting to be resolved. Mm -hmm. so they have to go, those political leaders that have been retained, all those people that are in jail, the political prisoners that were wrongly imprisoned, they need to be released so that the people could find some peace uh, and come to the table yeah. and speak with some dignity and respect. But I'm hearing it's really something. Important. What I hear you yeah. saying is that both sides have gotten it wrong, both on the government yeah. side, even in for those who are uh, calling for the secession. So you, you get a sense that uh, perhaps the formula in the past has not been correct, right? Yes, yes. All right. So the, the, it's not correct. The, the leadership is the, is, the, is the problem we're dealing with in Cameroon. Okay. Let's have, uh, let's have Eric chime in on this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I could agree more with, uh, with Charles. I mean, there's a, there's a problem. There's a problem of leadership. I mean, when we bring this back to the door of the president of the republic, is because we, you know, the, the, the kind of leadership we've, that has evolved in Cameroon has come up to this individual who controls all aspects of life. When Mr. President refused to even contemplate the notion of a federation, nobody around him wanted to contemplate that. And we, we, we would rather go to war than accept the notion of a federation, which, by the way, is the only way we are going to resolve the problems of Cameroon. You've never had in the history of the world a country that has gone from a unitary state to a federal state or from a federal state to a unitary state, and stayed at peace. Countries, you know, because the federal state guarantees some level of decentralized govern, uh, governance. So we moved from a federal state in Cameroon to a unitary state, and it has created all the problems we have in the country now. So there is need for the leadership of our country to take some bold and decisive steps. Mm -hmm with regard to the problems we have in that country today, to seriously consider uh, moving towards a federation. And I can tell them that, I can tell you know, the minister, that the vast majority of Anglophones today don't even want to hear, well, not the vast, maybe the vast majority, but a good chunk of the Anglophones don't even want to consider a federation. They've mm -hmm. gone beyond that. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, and that's a problem, uh, Vincent. You, yeah. know, we, you know, the government believes it can win by war, by fighting, by sending arms and soldiers, there's nothing could be more wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it's in the hearts of people, yeah. and we have to change the tactic yeah. to address yeah. that. I'm going to skip you, uh, uh, Bugasi, mm -hmm. and let me go to the minister. You've listened to Eric and also Charles, and here Eric is uh, talking about the issue of federation. I mean, if you're going to resolve a problem, you can actually go for the easier part of a uh, uh, solution before you, you, you kind of uh, confront the more difficult side. What is the issue? Why hasn't the government uh, at least acquiesced on the issue of federation, at least to give the people of the Anglophone a sense of uh, somewhat uh, self-rule self or internal rule? Um, thank you. Um, um, I say that there is no question which is taboo, mm. except cessation. If you put aside cessation, then uh, the government will listen to what you have to say, no problem. Uh, as far as the government is concerned, I always keep repeating the same thing. Now you raise the issue of, of, of coming back to uh, federalism. This is beyond the scope of my competence. Eric Finger knows it very well. And he says that uh, the only way, the only solution to this problem is to come back to federalism. Federalism. This is what he said. I respect his point of view. But right now, this is not the position of the government, because if this were the case, I would have a, 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 a claim this, this statement. But today, I am talking on behalf of the government. This is not the government 
position. But on behalf of government, I always keep saying the, the, the same thing. No question is taboo except so, you say, so that can be discussed also. Federalism can be discussed at some point, hopefully, as one of the uh, solutions to the problem. That's what you're saying, Mr. Minister. Yeah. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Hello? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, yes, but I say that on behalf of the government, I say what I am entitled to. Mm -hmm. and authorized to say. And we appreciate I say that uh, feder uh, federalism is not taboo in this nation. You can't say. Yeah. You can go to the radio, television, and express your, your, your point of view without any uh, uh, threat or consequence. No problem whatsoever. But sensation, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, w I want to quickly just get your thought, uh, uh, Bagasi, especially when you're listening to people there, whether you felt that uh, they would compromise on something like federalism if the government is willing at least to a, a little bit ease uh, yeah. its position on this. And, and talking to some Anglophone that I met uh, in Cameroon, uh, they felt like, you know, there is no one really who want to talk to them and sit down and listen to them, uh, especially during the elections. They say, look, we, people will not be able to vote, for example, who have been displaced, mm -hmm. you know, they have not been able to register where they are, and that what Elecam is saying is not really true, that because there are thousands of people, yeah. because Elecam said, you know, we had security measure in place. If people want to vote, they can go back to the Anglophone region and, and vote, and then we bring them back. People say, you yeah. see, yeah. that's what we've been talking about. Nobody yeah. take us really seriously. And I think uh, they need, as the minister say, if there is a dialogue after the president is swear, swear, uh, sworn in, yeah. then Absolutely. probably uh, something might start to work out. Now, we have uh, just a very few minutes left. I want to take it round. Uh, first, uh, uh, Charles and Chang. Uh, your final thought on the best way to move forward in Cameroon into the future? First thing, we need to recognize, the leadership has to recognize their mistakes and then tone it down. They need to take a humble pie and then go to the people, those, those prisoners of war that they have. Mm -hmm. They should be released. Thank and you. so there should be a, an environment of some sort of forgiveness and, and peace. Okay. So now they can right. bring them to the table they, and let's have a, co a constructive okay. destruction. Thank you. Let's hear from Eric. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. you know, the guys who are, the thousands of young people who are in jail today who should not be there. I mean, yeah. let's get, there's some basic things that need to be done. We need to do those things. Yeah. We need to get to the table. There are lots of people who say, let's go to the table and negotiate, yeah. or let's get to the table and dialogue. Whatever it is, yeah. let's get to the table. And I believe that we should demilitarize Anglophone Cameroon tomorrow, if All we right. could. In 30 seconds, uh, Honorable Minister, your last word. Thank you. We have to create a very conducive environment. In order to accept each other, we are different. Because we are different, we can enrich each other. We have to understand this. Mm -hmm. And all of us, at the end of the day, we have to accept ourselves with our difference. Then sit round the table by the grace of Allah. Okay. It's possible to find a solution. Okay. Let us Thank listen you. to what the head of state has Thank to you. say, and we are Th going to find the best Th solution. Thank you very much. And on that note, thanks to our guest, Honorable Issa Chiroma Bakari, Cameroon's Minister of Communication, Eric Chinje, analyst, Bagasi Kora, viewer journalist, and Charles Anchang, CEO of the Immigrant Magazine. Thanks for our, uh, to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's uh, Daybreak Africa with James Butty. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. Until next time, so long from Washington.